Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon for those joining from Singapore. Um, a very warm welcome to this web in our own Wrecking Havoc Collision, Wreck Removal and Salvage, um, kindly hosted by uh, Pennington's Manchester Cooper. Uh, many of you may know me, but just for those uh, who don't, let me introduce myself. I am Francesca Kappa. I am currently chairing the YMP. And uh, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with us, but for those who are not, um, the YMP is the Young Maritime Professional Association, which was founded by Dr. Aleka Shepard in 2011 in London as part of the London Shipping Law Center. Uh, the association was set up to promote the personal and professional development um, of young professional across the maritime industry through seminars, networking, and other educational um, events. The last couple of years have certainly been unusually challenge, uh, challenge, challenging for everyone and especially for young professional and have meant that our event have moved online. Uh, this has certainly given us the opportunity to reach a wider and more international audience and um, we're really, really, really grateful to have been able to establish and maintain um, collaboration with many similar organizations across the world and hosted joint event um, with many countries, including Italy, Brazil, the US um, and today Singapore. Before we commence, I would like to thank all the speakers um, and, of course, Pennington's uh, and in particular Nikki McKenzie for her work in coordinating and putting together to get today's webinar. Thank you also to Pennington's for kindly sponsoring uh, a number of breakfast and afternoon uh, snacks for those in Singapore uh, for us to enjoy while, while uh, listening to the presentation. And uh, before we commence, and I hand over back to Nikki, who's going to chair this session, I, I just, just a quick note for your diary. Given the current situation in Ukraine and the Black Sea, we will be hosting um, an online event on Monday, the 28th of March. Um, the time is to be confirmed, but this would be on the legal and practical issues um, being faced in connection with the Ukrainian conflict. And now I shall hand over to Nikki. Thank you very much. And um, just I'm going to just say thank you to the YMP as well for your assistance in putting this event together. Um, just some quick housekeeping from me. Um, just so everyone knows, this um, session will be being recorded. Um, if everyone could also please remain on mute until we get to the breakout sessions at the end. This will then give you an opportunity to um, interact and network with people as you wish. Um, in regards to any questions that you might have, please put these in the chat box um, and then we can deal with them at the Q&A session at the end. And um, those who want to remain anonymous, please just send me a Zoom message directly. Um, so thank you to all our speakers who've agreed to speak today. Um, I will um, introduce them now. So first we have Johan Wong from PMC's um, Singapore office. Um, Johan heads up the Singapore office and is the primary contact for the Singapore response team. He has extensive knowledge investigating collisions, grounding, fires, total loss claims, and dealing with a full range of issues, which include salvage and forum shopping battles arising from maritime casualties. Secondly, we have um, Graham Bells from Brooks Bell. Um, Graham is a master mariner with um, over 49 years experience in the marine industry since going to sea. He has been a marine consultant and surveyor since 1985, gaining wide ranging experience of marine salvage. He has attended a variety of salvage and wreck removal cases in various parts of the world, including Brazil, Philippines, Egypt, Israel, Ireland, Pakistan, Indonesia, and Europe. And then thirdly, we also have Daryl Kennard, who is a partner in Pennington Manchester Cooper's London office. Um, Daryl is a key member of the emergency response team and specializes in both wet and dry work from collisions, salvage groundings, total loss, fires and piracy, through to charge party disputes, and claims arising under bills of lading. And based in Norway for one year and in Singapore for five years, Dara receives instructions from salvers, containers, dry bulk and tanker owners, as well as charterers, traders, p &I clubs and other insurers. So thank you very much for attending. Um, I hope to chat with you more at the end um, in the breakout rooms, but um, to, let's kick things off um, then with our first speaker, Johan. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Nikki. Uh, thanks, Francesca, for the warm welcome and the kind introduction. 
uh, I should say a big hello to everyone. Um, a very good morning or good evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us. Um, and also I would say a quick uh, thank you to the uh, London Shipping Law Centre for putting this event together. Um, obviously delighted to be part of the global webinar series. So we've got a very, I guess you could say a very wet themed webinar this morning. Uh, we've got collisions, salvage and wreck removal all in one. I'm looking at the first bit, which is to do with collisions and with, a, I guess, a particular focus on uh, forum shopping. So first of all, a quick overview of what are the uh, things that I'll be looking to cover in the next 20 or 25 minutes. Uh, I've broken down the presentation, I suppose, into two sort of broad uh, areas. The first couple of slides, we'll be looking at uh, the theory uh, you know, what, what forum shopping is about, uh, how do you establish uh, jurisdiction, uh, uh, those sort of basic questions. Uh, and the last bit, we'll have a look at a, a short case study to try and put the theory into practice and see how it all sort of works uh, in an actual situation. So we move on to the first question, what is forum shopping? So I guess on a very basic level, Essentially, it's choosing uh, a jurisdiction that you want your claim to be heard. Um, this, I have to say, that this is a concept that is unique to shipping. Uh, and that's because of the very nature of shipping that ships move all around the world. Um, and linked intrinsically to that is the ability to arrest ships. And it's the combination of those two that give gives rise to the opportunity for a party to forum shop. I was going to read out uh, a quote because I don't think I could put it more eloquently. And this is something Lord Simon said uh, in the case of the Atlantic Star. It's quite an old case all the way back in 1974. And sort of explaining the concept of forum shopping, he said, forum shopping is indeed inescapably involved with the concept of maritime lien and the action in REM. Every port is automatically an admiralty emporium. And I thought that was brilliant. Essentially, every port becomes sort of a shopping mall uh, for a potential uh, jurisdiction, choice of jurisdiction. So why does it come up in collisions? Uh, well, in, in, in a contract, for example, you would expect not only to find a law and jurisdiction clause, where parties will agree uh, the place to refer the claims if there's a dispute that arises under the contract. Now, obviously, in the case of a collision, there is no pre-agreed jurisdiction. Uh, so parties have the ability sort of to shop around for a forum to have, to have the claims determined. Um, by default, the place of where the tort happens, where the collision occurred, is usually uh, known as the prima facie natural forum, but it's not binding on a party. So party can choose to go somewhere else or if necessary, prove or demonstrate that there is another jurisdiction that is better suited or more appropriate uh, to hear the claims. Uh, moving on, how do we establish jurisdiction? Well, broadly speaking, I think there are two, uh, two ways we can establish jurisdiction. The first way, if you've got, I suppose, a friendly and sensible opposition on the other side, uh, you might be able to do it by way of agreement. And usually you do it by, uh, by way of an, a, collision, a collision jurisdiction agreement. Uh, the Admiralty Solicitors Group in London, they have a uh, standard wording, which is widely used and accepted. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I've put up the link, I put up the link uh, on the screen um, so if anyone wants to have a look at what the document looks like, uh, you can, you can go to the website. Um, and the hybrid form, hybrid forms. And what I mean by that, it's really, it's a variation of the standard ASG wording. So typically, um, parties would agree, for example, to refer the claims to the English court and to be determined in accordance with English law. But if for some reason, um, how parties wanted to to um, vary that. It is possible, for example, to agree for the claims to be heard in the English courts, but subject to Indian law or Malaysian law. Uh, another possible variation would be 
to have the claims determined uh, by the English courts in accordance with English law, but to have the issue of limitation of liability subject to a different regime. So those, those are possible, but as I say, I mean, as long as both sides are prepared to agree, uh, then, then that's absolutely fine. Now, if we don't have uh, a friendly or sensible opposition on the other side, or more likely uh, in a situation where there is an advantage to be gained, depending on where the claim ends up, then you might end up having to, to establish jurisdiction by way of legal proceedings. And the two um, uh, main options are how, that you can, how you can do that. The first one will be by way of a ship arrest. So that's an action in REM. Where, where you commence an action against the res, the thing itself. Uh, so obviously you have the offending vessel as an obvious target, but beyond that, uh, you also have potential options of effecting either a sister ship arrest or an associate ship arrest. What is the difference? Uh, a sister ship is one where uh, it is in the same registered ownership. So if, for example, the offending vessel in the collision is owned by, say, a Mr. X, and Mr. X owns another vessel, then those are, the, the, those are two sister ships, and you would be entitled to the rest, either of them. Uh, an associated ship, on the other hand, is where the ships are registered to different owners, but if you can establish that there is a single beneficial controlling interest to link both of those owners, then you might be able to effect uh, what we call an associated ship arrest. The only caveat, I suppose, is there are fairly limited jurisdictions that would allow an associated ship arrest. Uh, most notably, that's uh, South Africa. I think France is the other one. So the, the options are quite limited. Whereas for a sister ship arrest, uh, most common law jurisdictions would allow you to, to effect a sister ship arrest. Now, apart from an in-rem action, you also have the option of going starting an in-personam action against the owners of the vessel. So if um, the owner is resident in, say, Malaysia, notwithstanding that the collision might have happened somewhere else, say in China or, you know, off Australia, you could still start an action against the owners in Malaysia and try to establish jurisdiction that way. Right, and on to the next question. What is the goal? So why are we doing all of this? Well, very simply, it is to put you, or more, more appropriately, your clients in the best position possible. Now, what is the best position obviously is relative. It depends uh, to a large degree on whether you, your clients are gonna be the net paying party or the net receiving party. Uh, I stress net because we're not really concerned about the individual claims. It's a net position that will determine uh, the strategy. Uh, so we're looking at taking into account any apportionment of liability of the claims, setting off the cross claims against each other and what comes out in the wash. So you would have in a collision situation, one side that will end up being the paying party and the other side uh, likely being the receiving party. Uh, and the main objective obviously is to put yourself in a position of strength so that if you are, whether you're negotiating a settlement or in the last resort, if say a settlement cannot be achieved, you also have the safe, safety net to know that uh, if the claims are fully fought, you are in a jurisdiction uh, where you might get a favorable result. Moving on to the, to the next uh, question. So what are some of the key considerations when we're forum shopping? Well, I think the main driver, and if, and if you look at all the reported cases where there's a forum shopping battle, is usually when limitation is a factor. Um, I, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the different regimes because I think that's a, a presentation on its own, uh, but a simple sort of run through, um, we've got the 57 convention, which is uh, the lowest limit. Uh, and it's easily breakable. Uh, there are not many jurisdictions that still apply the 57 convention. Um, then you've got the 76 limits, which was basically a package deal. Uh, the limits were increased, but as a, as a trade-off, the test was changed so that it, it was more or less virtually unbreakable. Uh, and then the 96 protocol 
and 2015 limits apply the same test as the 76 limits, uh, but the, 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 the amounts have been revised upwards to take into account the increasing cost of claims um, and casualties. Another, another key consideration when you're, when you're forum shopping is uh, you are looking at where you can arrest because that's one of the key um, targets when you're trying to forum shop. So what you'll be doing is you'll be analyzing the trading patterns of the vessels, of any sister ships, uh, associated vessels. Uh, and, and just because the vessel turns up at a particular port doesn't always mean that you will have the option of arresting because there are jurisdictions that do not allow ship arrest. So for example, um, Indonesia, uh, they, they don't have the same concept of ship arrest. So even if the vessel turns up in Indonesia, you can't simply just arrest the vessel. And I think it's the same uh, with Thailand. So essentially you would be looking out for jurisdictions, which we would call are arrest friendly uh, and where it'd be easy uh, to effect the arrest but within a short space of time. And the last consideration, I suppose, would be the litigation risk. Uh, as I sort of mentioned in the earlier slides, in the event that a settlement can't be achieved, essentially you want to have the comfort of knowing that if the matter is fully fought, then you'd have the infrastructure in place where you've got experienced judges or a specialist maritime court that will be able to hear the claim. Uh, and I guess to, that, to go in hand in hand with that, uh, is to have predictability and certainty of the outcome. Now, by the same token, sometimes I guess if if you had a really bad case and you know you are sort of hiding to nothing, uh, it could be a different consideration. You might want to choose a jurisdiction where the, the courts will take a long time to process the claim. Uh, so, so for example, if you know that there's a particular jurisdiction where the claim might be tied up for eight nine, 10 years, then that, it, then that in itself might be a strategy because uh, you, you're hoping that that will wear down the other side and sort of force them to come to the table. So th there is no one size fits all. It kind of depends on what is it you are looking to achieve. All right, now moving on to, well, so that was the theory bit. Uh, now, hopefully when we look at the case study, you can see how, how some of those uh, factors uh, come into play. So a quick run through the facts. Um, this is a case involving the vessel called the Mili and the Taki 18. Uh, if we have the next slide, please. Sorry, thanks. Yep, so Taki 18 and Mili both shaping to join the westbound lane of the Singapore traffic separation scheme. Uh, this was an overtaking situation with Millie the overtaking vessel. Uh, she makes an alteration, of course, to starboard in an attempt to cross the head of the Taki 18, gets it horribly wrong, ends up making contact with Taki 18 in way of her aft port quarter. And as a result of that contact, uh, Taki 18's hull is breached. She takes on water and eventually sink sinks. So it's a bit of a disaster. Uh, I've Put up a plot on the next slide. Uh, this this is a plot that was taken from an actual collision, but obviously we changed the names to protect the innocent, as you say. Uh, but you can see that so Millie is coming down on the port side uh, and shaping to overtake Taki 18. Uh, she tries to, uh, I suppose, cut across ahead uh, and gets it wrong, and hence the collision. So. In order to, to decide where we, where we go, what to strategize, the first thing we have to do is to try and work out who is gonna be the net paying party and who's gonna be the net receiving party. And in order to do that, we have to make an early assessment of liability and quantum. So in this situation, since it's an overtaking, we know that it's gonna be uh, rule 13 of the Colorex that will be applicable. And rule, rule 13 basically says that any vessel overtaking any other shall keep out of the way of the vessel being overtaken. What it means is uh, Millie would be primarily responsible or will have the primary responsibility to keep clear of Taki 18. So quite quickly, we can work out that she will bear the preponderance of blame. 
Now, we might not be able to narrow down exactly what the portion might be, but we can get it within a range uh, and we can sort of guess that it's going to be heavy against Millie. So easily 90, 10, 80, 20 uh, against Millie. Now, that's just one part of the equation. Uh, so we, then we need to feed in the numbers to try and work out uh, what, the, what the net um, outcome might be. So an early assessment of quantum based on uh, the surveys of carried out in vessels, uh, apparently Mealy has sustained fairly minor damage. So uh, her claim is not very substantial at all. Taki 18, on the other hand, is a total loss. And so her claims are estimated uh, in, the, in, in the amount of 30 million US. Uh, so that's potential wreck removal costs, water pollution cleanup, loss of the vessel and cargo. So putting those two together, you know that Mealy is going to be heavily to blame and you've got a whopping claim of 30 million coming uh, against her. Uh, so quite easily, you can see that Millie is, Millie is going to be the net paying party. Right, so now with that worked out, if we put on our Millie caps for a moment uh, and pretend that we are acting for the Millie interests, what would be the objective? Well, the first objective is to minimize or limit as much as possible Millie's potential exposure. Because we know that she is going to be the one that's paying, uh, paying out in this, in this collision. What are the potential targets? Well, uh, we have the registered owners of Millie that are based in East Malaysia. So we have the option of starting a limitation action in the home jurisdiction. Whether we want to do that, we'll, we'll have a look at that. Uh, we'll consider that in a bit more detail uh, in the next couple of slides. There's Taki 18's uh, registered owners that are based in Indonesia. Now, is that a jurisdiction we want to go to? Again, we'll, we'll have a look at that. Taki 18 itself, now we know she's sunk, so she's a wreck. So can you arrest the wreck? Well, in theory, I guess you can. Uh, there was the case of uh, the main galaxy, Hersic Novi, uh, where... Uh, I think it was Sintinko. This was back in 1996, where they serve uh, the wreck, uh, serve a writ on the mast that was still sticking out of the water, and that was considered um, good service. And in fact, we've I think we did one better. Daryl remember this case. Uh, this is an old one back in 2001, where there's a collision in the Malacca Straits. Uh, our vessel sank, but we wanted to. Uh, our vessel sank in Malaysian waters, and we wanted to try to uh, establish Malaysian jurisdiction for the claim because back then, West Malaysia was still applying the 57 limitation, and we wanted the ability to break that limitation. And we managed to persuade the Malaysian courts to allow us to serve a writ on the wreck. Uh, so we had to engage a diver to dive down onto the wreck, attach the writ onto uh, the structure, take a photograph of that and that was deemed to be good service. Uh, so yeah, possibility maybe. And then Taki 18 has two sister vessels uh, and they call regularly to China and West Malaysia. So the potential jurisdictions that are available or, or on offer, I guess, if you're looking from the Mili, from Mili's point of view, is you've got Malaysia, East and West, Indonesia and China. Now if we flip over to the other side of the coin, and assume for a moment that we were acting for the Taki 18 interest, uh, the objective would be right the other way around. We will, we'll be trying to extract as much as we can uh, from the recovery uh, because we've got a huge claim and we want to recover as much as we can from, uh, from the Mili interest. So what are the potential targets? We track the movement of Mili. We find that she calls uh, into Singapore and Thailand on a regular basis. So that's a potential options. Those are potential options. Uh, we are able to find out that she has got two associated ships, but unfortunately, they don't trade to South Africa. So that kind of takes the option off the table. We've got the Millie's uh, rigid owners, as we already discussed in a previous slide, based in East Malaysia, and Taki 18's own owners, which are based in Indonesia. So for Taki 18, the potential jurisdictions on offer are Singapore, Thailand, East Malaysia, and Indonesia. Now, if we put all those options onto a map, this is what it looks like. So, if you remember from uh, the earlier slides when we're looking at limitation, 
where we said that 57 was the lowest limitation regime and working away working our way upwards 2015 being being the highest limits then i suppose right off the bat we would say if we were milli uh, we would want to get into perhaps east malaysia because that's the lowest limit but the flip side or the danger of that is uh, that limit could be broken quite easily so it would be a high stakes gamble if we went there if we succeed, obviously it'd be great because then we get the claim down to a very small number. But if limitation is broken, then we would be exposed to the full value claim, a $30 million claim. So that's that's quite a high high risk gamble. So if we were strategizing for Millie, maybe East Malaysia would not be the first or an ideal choice. Maybe we'll be looking at China. China will be 1976, which would have a lower limit. Uh, uh, in between would be uh, an in between option might be to go to West Malaysia, where that's a 1996 protocol. For Taki 18, on the other hand, there'll be no question the the jurisdiction you'll be gunning for will be Singapore, because for a claim for 30 million, you want to make sure that you get the maximum amount back, uh, and uh, all the other jurisdictions won't really won't really cut it. Now, just to illustrate how. Uh, the limitation regime will have an impact on the numbers. If we look at the next slide, under the well, based this is based this is tonnage limitation based on uh, on Millie's gross tonnage. So under the seventy six limit, her limitation fund will come up to eight point one million. So for a claim of thirty million, if we are able to secure uh, a seventy six jurisdiction then potentially we would be able to save uh, the Millie uh, clients uh, $22 million. On the flip side, for Taki 18, they would certainly be looking at a 2015 limit because then they would be able to maximize the full value of the recovery. Uh, an option in the, in, in the middle would be a Malaysia, a West Malaysia, which applies the 1996 protocol. Uh, so even if that's a 19.5 million uh, limitation limit uh, limit of liability, uh, you would already be saving potentially 10 million of the of the of the claim of 30 million. So those are the factors that are sort of balancing out. Where do you go? Uh, what are the risk profile? And what are the considerations? Now the other thing I should point out: this this scenario has come up because limitation is a factor. Now, quite clearly, if it was a different numbers game, so if, for example, Taki 18 didn't sink and she had relatively minor damage as well, uh, and her claims were, say, in the range of two to five million, then even if Millie was 100% to blame for the collision, which is obviously the absolute worst case scenario, quite easily you can see that that amount will fall well below any of the, or any of the limitation regimes which means that there is no advantage to be gained, whether, whether we chose a 76 jurisdiction, 96 protocol jurisdiction, or 2015 limit jurisdiction. So the, the, the forum shopping comes up in this case because uh, limitation is clearly a factor. So final thoughts and takeaway points, hopefully from, from the very short case study, um, it sort of illustrates why getting a right getting into the right jurisdiction can be absolutely key. Uh, in order to do that or to make the assessment, uh, you have to work out quite quickly uh, based on liability and quantum, who is going to be the net paying party and who is going to be the net receiving party. Because only with that information, once you've determined uh, the outcome, then you can build a strategy to decide which is the best jurisdiction to go for your claim. Um, you have to remember, you have to remember to investigate and track as many sister ships as possible because that will uh, increase the potential options that are available to you. So you should cast the net as wide as possible. And ultimately the main goal is to make sure that you are in a, are in the jurisdiction that puts you in the strongest position, whether that is to negotiate a settlement of the claim or in the worst case, if you have to fall back on litigation, 
that you're in a jurisdiction that will give you uh, a favorable result. So I think that's the end of my bit, and hopefully that uh, uh, gives gives sort of a, a rough overview of form shopping as a concept and how it kind of works uh, if you put it in play and natural situation. Thank you very much, Johan. Um, really informative um, talk there. So um, then I'll move on to our next speaker. Again, I'll be dealing with um, questions and answers kind of at the end of the presentation. So um, yeah, I'd like to introduce Graham from Brooks Bell. Thank you, Nikki, and uh, thank you for the introduction earlier, and thank you for the opportunity um, to speaking to you all, and uh, have a good day. Um, I'm here to talk about the um, a, a classic LOF situation at Ashdod in Israel. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this, this was um, an LOF with Scopic involved. Um, I was... Uh, instructed as the uh, SCR initially. Uh, I was there for two weeks, set the, um, set the job up. And then my colleague Adrian took over um, for the final um, couple of weeks and managed to get the vessel refloated, which was a success story. But this is a classic case. Um, next, next slide, please. The ship um, was only a little ship, single hold bolt carrier. She'd been at anchor off Ashdod having discharged a cargo of cement clinker. Um, horrendous weather over Christmas and the new year. Um, she, um, she was at anchor and dragged. And had the people on board paid more attention, perhaps this wouldn't have happened, but um, she dragged successfully. And then eventually the anchor broke, or the cable broke. And they didn't spot it until she was in the surf line. Uh, they deployed the other anchor, by which, it was, by which time it was far too late. They tried the engines, it was too late. And uh, she ended up high and dry on the beach, right in front of the, um, the, the sea, sea front, um, right next to the breakwaters that were the port. Had she been on the breakwaters, it would have been a wreck removal, but she was only a ship length clear of them, sitting on a nice hard sandy beach. Next slide, please. And there you see the ship from a drone um, in the bottom right hand corner, right up close to the breakwaters. And that was a big problem with the salvage operation because we had to make sure that uh, with successive storms that came in, she wasn't going to work her way up the beach um, and impale herself on the breakwaters. Um, the location of Ashdod, as you can see on the left, left hand side, um, and uh, at the top right hand side, is the AIS track. This is the um, automatic uh, information system track, which is recorded. And it shows the ship symbols um, at the anchorage, uh, yawing back and forth as they do at anchor. A little bit of drag, the anchor holding, uh, a bit more yawing back and forth, another drag, a bit more holding. And then suddenly the anchor breaks um, and she made a progress straight up to the beach. Um, as I say, if the crew had been, been alert, they might have kept her off the beach, but they didn't. Um, now, there's not much tide in Israel, and um, it, it's less than a metre, so the tide wasn't really significant in terms of salvage. Um, at low tide, we were able to walk up to the, the bow of the ship with, with, um, with normal shoes on almost, and uh, climb up a ladder. So the means of access was fairly easy. But as I said, the weather was horrendous around that period. Um, I got out there on uh, New Year's Eve and um, spent a very unusual New Year's day um, getting my feet wet. Um, next slide, please. As I say, a little bulk carrier. Um, she had uh, no cargo on board, and this is a uh, salvage nightmare. Uh, salvers like to be able to lighten vessels to, to get them off to reduce the draft, which makes life easier. But when there's no cargo to get off, um, that is not a possibility. Nor did she have any ballast. And that was the uh, part of the problem at Anger. I think there was something wrong with the ballast system and they tried to avoid ballasting. So she was at Anger very light, which is the worst situation to be in in bad weather because you've got a lot of windage. Um, she had a very small amount of fuel in the 
um, double bottom tanks under the engine room and just forward of the engine room. And that was another problem with the salvage. Um, although the bottom was, was uh, sandy, hard sand, there was a danger always we were going to get the fuel tanks ruptured, which would have made the salvage more exciting. So the oil was, was transferred out. Next slide, please. Um, very small ship. Um, the initial ground reaction, um, this is the, the actual weight that's sitting on the ground as opposed to being buoyant, was, was almost total at low tide, but at high tide, uh, there was some buoyancy, but very little. And the ship did settle into the sand and made herself a little bathtub in the sand. So that uh, at times she was actually floating, but in a in a bath of sand with with sandbanks all around. Um, <clears throat> so the the salvage plan um, initially to ballast down. Now this is a, a rather counter counterintuitive trick um, that is used in salvage. If the ship is very light and bouncing around on on big swell. Um, ballasting down is, is something that uh, can pin her down on the ground. And this was a classic case where, um, with a hard sandy beach, ballasting down was advantageous to stop her moving. And with those breakwaters in, um, in mind, we didn't want her floating away on every storm and going further up the beach. We had to carry out a bathymetric survey. Um, this was a very long, shallow uh, shelving beach, and uh, there was no immediate escape route out through a channel or anything. It was just uniform beach all the way out. And uh, that was another problem because it meant that tugs, <clears throat> when eventually we had tugs, had to be located in deep water, which meant very long tow lines and tow lines coming through the surf. Now, um, nowadays we, we use Dyneema rope, which is buoyant and very strong and smaller than wire for, for the same strength. Um, and we managed to procure a very long Dyneema rope over a kilometre long, which um, enabled the, uh, the, the rope to be floated in the surf. Had we used traditional wires, the wire would have had to have been buoyed every metre or so to keep it afloat, and that would have been a very expensive and time-consuming operation. One of the big problems with this job was the, um, the strength of the ship's deck fittings, particularly on the poop deck. The, the bollards on the poop deck were only tack welded to the poop and the underdeck structure was practically non-existent. Um, had we put a tug on the, on the bollards, they'd have just pulled off. So we had to rebuild the poop deck. Um, we had to recover the starboard anchor because that was lying back and underneath the, uh, the vessel. She was almost sitting on it, but not quite fortunately. So we had to recover that and get that out of the water. We had to build um, the, the tug connection points. And then when we were ready to tow, we had to de-ballast um, rapidly to, to get the buoyancy to pull her out. But before we did that, we had to remove the sand and dredging became a big issue here. We had to actually make a channel to, to get the ship out. And that was done um, variously with bulldozers and, and excavators and a dredger. Um, and then we had to pull her out through the floating path that had been uh, dug. And then there had to be the post floating inspection and redelivery to owners. So it all sounds very easy, but it wasn't quite so. Can we have the next slide, please. This is the uh, deck reinforcing that was carried out. On the, uh, the right side there um, are the bollards with the wires ready for the towing bridle with um, fairly massive reinforcement that we, we built around on deck and under deck in the storeroom. Uh, the naval architects came up with um, some sophisticated engineering drawings to uh, make sure that the aft deck was strong enough for the, for the bollard pull of the tug. The idea was to put one tug on the forward end, uh, the big main tug on the forward end, but the aft tug was there really to keep the um, the aft end of the ship away from the breakwaters. Next slide, please. So there we have the um, top left-hand corner. We have the towing, the main towing bridle, which we threaded through the hawse pipes um, using the ship's natural structure as strength. So there was a, a, whole, um, a bridle rigged through there 
We didn't use the chains because they weren't considered strong enough, as they'd already proved. So we put uh, big heavy wires up and through um, and just used the, the horse pipes as a securing point with a bridle outside. Um, down the bottom left, you can see the, the personal access up the pilot ladder. Um, we used bulldozers to build sand up there to make access easier to be getting stores and things on board. Um, you could walk around the wreck at, um, at low water um, just with a pair of wellies right, right the way around. So clearly there wasn't enough water. And here at the right side, we had the excavators day and night digging away to, to excavate. But this sand was very mobile. And um, as soon as we had a, a, another spot of bad weather, every everything we dug out filled back in again. So it was a, a running battle. Next slide, please. Here we had um, dredges, uh, both floating suction dredges, working with, with the excavators, um, working day and night, as I would say, to clear um, a, a floating channel. Bottom left is, is Adrian um, standing near the aft end of the ship in what should have been deep water, but uh, wasn't at that stage. Next slide, please. The, the refloating effort, um, the tugs were connected um, and the, the main effort was to rotate the ship, which was heading inshore and to rotate her completely um, through more than 90 degrees so that she was heading out to sea and then pull on the bow um, when she was rotated down the refloating path. Um, that was a theory and um, it actually took over three days to, to rotate because all the time with the tug leaning on the wire at the forward end, um, causing that turning um, effort, the, the diggers had to dig to clear the sand, to clear the ship, to swing it round, pointing out to sea. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a video which should run, um, and this shows the initial position AIS at anchor. Um, you can see the ship in the um, left-hand side there with the various plots where she has been uh, at anchor over quite a period. Um, is it going to run? Yes, here we go. This is all sped up, but she drags and then holds for a bit, drags and then holds a bit. Um, and then suddenly drags and there she is on the beach. And um, the crew made attempts to uh, use engines to get her off, but uh, to no avail. Um, so here are the excavators. This is a time-lapse picture that Adrian, my colleague, set up um, over the operation to get an idea of what was going on. Diggers digging, the dredger, suction dredger there, clearing the path. Um, there was an awful lot of sand moved and we got a lot of bad weather. So every time the, the storms came in, the, um, the sand filled the hole up again. And you can see the men walking around there in the, uh, in the surf. Here we've got the tow line connected on the forward end. Um, you can see the line just above where it says star. Um, and uh, at this stage, they're starting to put weight on the, the forward end to rotate it. And as you can see, with the time lapse, the, the ship is starting to rotate. This process took three days and three minutes from connection of tow to, to actual refloating. So during the night, the tug was leaning on the wire all the time, and gradually um, the bow was rotated round, which is, is terribly exciting when it happens because uh, you know something's working, but the, the stern is still deeply embedded in sand, so you're not, you're not out yet. Um, you can see the wire there in the surf, above the surf, um, pulling on the bow and another wire at the aft end. The, the tug at the aft end was primarily keeping the stern away from the breakwaters as the rotation happened. Um, as the rotation happened, the, the diggers had to keep coming and clearing the, the sand out from in, underneath the bow. Um, and there you can see the tug um, with the wire and it's it's oscillating backwards and forwards. That's a deliberate ploy to to um, try and ease the uh, 
the ship around, the, the bright lights of the tug there at night. This is the second night. And she's rotating nicely. The two tugs there now with their working lights oscillating back and forth to keep the, keep the ship moving. Bad weather was a friend in this case, and quite often is as a salvor's friend to give, give the ship a bit of bounce, which helps with dynamics to clear the uh, sand out from underneath. Here we had bad weather and um, uh, the, the surf, we're in, we're in the surf line now, pointing in the right direction, but still not clear. And uh, with, with the surf, the ship will bounce um, very slightly, but every little bounce can, can help. The two tugs there, one forward and one aft, working together, and uh, well, she got out. <laughs> um, okay, well, that's um, basically the roundup of a quite a complicated um, salvage. Little ship, shouldn't have happened, but it did. And um, there we go. So, thank you very much. Over to Nikki. Yeah, thank you very much, Graham. That was uh, really informative. Um, so then now on to our next speaker, Daryl. Yeah, right. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the CSCL Jupiter, another live case uh, that happened uh, uh, probably four years ago now. The CSCL Jupiter, she was a fully cellular container ship built in 2011, uh, a dead weight of 155,000 odd tonnes, and a GRT of 150,000 tonnes, uh, and she's capable of carrying 14,000, just over 14,000 TEUs. TEUs is a 20-foot container. Um, and, and just in case there's any doubt, she is large. Uh, so there's a, a picture of her uh, in a laden state leaving. You can see that she has uh, containers across the deck about 12 to 14 uh, rows uh, and, and stacked very high. So she's enormous and I'll explain how enormous she is. And she had the misfortune to uh, ground at full speed on the River Scheldt, uh, which is known as being a particularly dangerous river, as I'll explain. And that's her in her uh, laden state uh, up on the, uh, the river bank. And if you look at the, uh, the, the, the uh, plimsoll line, you can see how the bulbous bow is well out of the water at the, at the front and uh, the, um, the plimsoll line, the red line, disappears into water at the stern. So uh, uh, in contrast to Graham's example, this is a vessel at the other end of the scale. She's enormous. Uh, so the basic facts. On the 14th of August 2017, she grounded on the River Scheldt. She'd had a steering gear failure. Her speed leading up to the grounding was about 14 knots. So she was basically going uh, at uh, full ahead for the speed that she would ordinarily be doing in the river. Uh, and consequently, she was hard aground and unable to refloat herself without the help of professional assistance. She's about 300 meters long and she was hard aground uh, uh, along 100 metres of her length. Uh, so uh, I, I also have a little video clip of her going aground. So this is her AIS track. Uh, she's um, outbound from Antwerp. She comes round the, uh, the bend at the Bath, the bend of Bath, and goes straight forward uh, and into the mud and rocks that are there. Uh, within a short space of time, obviously this is all speeded up, uh, tugs started to arrive uh, and they tried to refloat her. Uh, uh, she of course went aground at high tide, navigating at high tide. That wasn't possible. She went through a low tide and then the, in the evening, uh, you can see the tugs like ants all crawling around her to pull her off. And you can see how they wiggle uh, the vessel to break the suction with the mud and uh, force her away uh, back. Uh, and of course, one of the big dangers with a vessel of this size is once you pull her off, you need to keep her under control uh, because you don't want to then ground on the uh, other bank. Uh, but a successful operation uh, with as many tugs as you will see involved in a single salvage operation.
So she was laden with both 20 foot and 40 foot containers. Uh, and in, in the condition in which she was laden, that amounted to about 10,000 TEU. So she wasn't at full uh, capacity, but she was um, probably about 70%. G given her size and her laden condition, there were substantial ground force reactions. Uh, and this gave rise to a real concern on the part of the authorities that she might break her back. Well, what do we mean by break her back? That the, 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 the authorities were concerned that they might have another farrowet on their hands. If you look at the farrowet there, you can see that in the middle, uh, her back is broken. She is um, a, 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 at an unusual angle as she sits on the mud. Um, now, just in terms of contrasting size, uh, the Farouette had a capacity, TEU capacity of 3,800 TEUs and a GRT of 48,000 tonnes. So she was a much smaller container ship. Uh, and that took uh, many weeks to, once the, the back had been broken, the containers had to be lightened. Uh, so you had to bring out barges and cranes to lighten her. And that took uh, uh, a number of weeks to uh, perform. Um, the interesting story of, of this case, the, uh, the vessel went to ground, uh, the uh, would-be salvors uh, were promptly on site, offering to refloat the vessel on LOF terms. Uh, the master declined to, to, to sign on LOF terms uh, and uh, said that he thought he could uh, uh, engage other towage companies to refloat him on commercial terms. Um, a discussion was being had between the master and the would-be salvage officer on the bridge about whether LOF was appropriate. Uh, and as they were speaking, uh, they both felt the back of the vessel break, at which stage the master said, OK, well, fine, I'll sign the LOF now, because it was pretty clear that she wasn't getting off very easily. So uh, size is always a difficult thing to comprehend, particularly when you're just sat behind a desk. So I, I, I've got here a little pictorial of the size of container vessels as they've grown. And the Farouette uh, is up there uh, around the 4,000 uh, TU mark. Uh, uh, and the APL Panama, which I will talk about uh, as well, or mention uh, as well. And then the CSCL Jupiter, you can see, is uh, quite a lot bigger. Um, probably two and a half times to three times bigger. And just so that you, to complete everything I put in the Ever Given, uh, so you can see how she compares to the Ever Given and how the, how the Ever Given is, is so enormous compared to the others. So in this case, assistance was rendered promptly on LOF terms. So there was an agreement by the master uh, promptly to agree LOF, although uh, that agreement was um, concluded over the VHF radio. Uh, as often happens when the owners hear that LOF has been agreed, they think they can do rather better and dispute the agreement to LOF. Uh, but after three or four days or, or a week arguing about whether LOF has agreed, they finally agreed that in fact it had been con concluded. So we had a rather unusual situation where um, the vessel had been refloated on LOF but there was a dispute about whether LOF had been agreed and that wasn't resolved until some days after the vessel was, uh, uh, had, had been refloated. Of course, for the salvors, one of the duties the salvage company owes under an LOF contract is to use its best endeavors to salve the vessel. So if you have a concluded agreement, you as a salvor are under obligations to get on with the salvage. And so you can't sit around waiting for the dispute to be sorted out. The vessel, as I said, had grounded at high tide and she remained aground through a low tide. On that first high tide, uh, there was insufficient um, time uh, as, as the tide was ebbing to uh, uh, have enough uh, tugs and equipment in place to uh, refloat her. But she was successfully re refloated on the second high tide in the evening. Uh, and it was quite a spectacle on the River Scheldt. Uh, everyone turned up to, to watch uh, some 16 tugs push and pull and to, to wiggle the vessel off. Uh, 
any LOF uh, uh, contract uh, is assessed, the reward is assessed by reference to the Article 13 of the Salvage Convention of 1989. It's important to, from the outset, appreciate that market forces and commercial rates have little, if any, relevance to fixing the reward. Uh, one of the best ways, perhaps, of, uh, of explaining why market forces play no part is to draw your attention to one of the provisions in the Salvage Convention, uh, which uh, permits a court to set aside uh, a commercial agreement uh, to salva for a fixed price if it is felt that undue duress has been used in order to uh, fix that price. So, for example, if a salvor turns up to a vessel that is in need of immediate and urgent assistance and will be aground on the rocks if assistance is not provided immediately and the salvor says, well, market forces, I'm the only tug in town. I want you to pay me $30 million. Your ship's worth $50 million, but I want you to pay me $30 million and I'll hook up a tow and uh, move you out the way. That would be unconscionable. It's contrary to public policy. Public policy requires that salvage craft are engaged promptly so that any damage to property, lives, and most importantly, the environment are minimized. And they don't, the, the public policy does not want uh, commercial parties to act like commercial parties and try and negotiate the best deal for themselves having regard to market forces, all the while the vessel uh, and the casualty puts herself in greater danger. So the flip side to that is the reward is agreed later. The reward is always going to be the difficult thing to work out and it's agreed later uh, and it's fixed by reference to the Article 13 of the Salvage Convention. The, the first point to note is it's fixed with a view to encouraging salvage operations. It's very much in the best interests of all of us that salvage operations uh, uh, that there is salvage equipment to conduct salvage operations quickly so that property is not lost, damage is not sustained to the environment, uh, uh, that is beneficial for everyone. Um, the, the criteria are, are listed here, I'm just going to run through them quite quickly. Uh, we have the salved value of the property, so the, 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 the value of all the property that's saved, um, the, the skill and efforts in minimising damage to the environment, that is an important standalone ingredient. The measure of success is a particularly important ingredient. Nature and degree of dangers. Most salvage cases, well all salvage cases, will look at the dangers the casualty faced and uh, what would have happened if salvage services had not been provided. Uh, the skill and efforts of the salvor in salving the vessel and property and life some salvage cases won't require so much skill and effort, others will require a very high degree of skill and effort. The time used and the losses incurred uh, by the salvors. So uh, a, a, a one day operation uh, will involve, may involve a salvor incurring little in the way of costs and downtime to his equipment, uh, but a th three week operation will obviously in involve his assets being tied up for considerably longer and he is likely to in, in such an operation to have incurred out-of-pocket expenses in other words hired in other equipment craft and personnel to assist with the job uh, the risk and liability and other risks run by the salvors so some salvage operations will um, w w won't really involve any risk to the salvage equipment the salvors equipment or personnel uh, others for example, rescuing stricken vessels in storms and putting your lives in danger are, are, are at the other end of the scale. Uh, the promptness of the services rendered and the availability and use of the vessels. You'll recall that uh, public policy requires uh, that salvage is encouraged uh, and uh, it is particularly deserving of an encouraging award if a salvor has lots of equipment in a state of constant readiness and has tugs on station to assist uh, stricken vessels uh, at the drop of a hat. 
um, uh, uh, that that uh, will uh, come at an expense to the salvor, maintaining, maintaining everything in a state of alertness and readiness, and it and it will it deserves is part of the criteria that goes into the mix. Other considerations uh, in assessing the award, an LOF arbitrator will have regard to other comparable cases. Um, I think in this particular case of the CSCL Jupiter, there aren't really any other comparable cases. So the, 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 the process of assessing the award wasn't guided by that. Uh, it is also a key principle that the award should not be out of all proportion to the services rendered. This is the moderating principle. Of course, what one person thinks is out of all proportion, another person thinks is uh, quite proportionate. Um, but there, that is the uh, nature of assessing awards. Um, the award can never exceed the value of the salved property. Uh, in a case like the CSCL Jupiter, that's not really going to be much of a problem. We have a, uh, an enormous salve fund. But in a, a case like the Zelex Star, uh, if, Ella, if Scopic had not been invoked, then the Salvors would have been uh, spending all of that time, money and expense, and they would have a small pot from which to recover. Um, uh, and, and that is why they invoked Scopic in that case. And uh, uh, one of the fundamental principles of salvage is a no cure, no pay contract. That means that if you spend three weeks, so let's think about the recent car carrier uh, that sank uh, off of Portugal, I think last week, uh, salvors were engaged. I, I myself don't know whether they invoked Scopic or whether it was simply on LOF terms. They may well have kept it on LOF terms because the values were enormous. Um, if they had kept it on LOF terms, uh, then they would have spent two weeks trying to salve that vessel, it sank, they would get nothing at all for their troubles. So let's look at this case. In this case, the ship had a salved value of 61 and a half million. The bunkers on board were worth half a million. The container shells, 11.7 million, and the cargo, 277 million. Uh, we're now all familiar following the ever given with how valuable containerized cargoes on very large container ships can be. And the total of the salved values were 350 million odd euros. So the assets used in the salvage in this case, we had 17 tugs and two support vessels. Uh, I think there were 15 or 16 at the time of refloating, but one of the tugs had been switched out. They had a combined Pollard pool of 1,135 and a combined value of 89, almost 90 million euros. So the salvors between them had 90 million euros worth of assets on hand available to be deployed at a moment's notice to uh, refloat the vessel. At the services rendered, well, there was prompt mobilization and skilled use of 17 tugs by a salvage officer and 17 highly qualified salvage personnel. So not only were the tugs and the salvage equipment being assembled promptly, but all of the personnel needed to carry out the different calculations to, uh, to, to be on board and uh, assist in ballasting and uh, connecting lines and pushing and pulling on tugs were all assembled very quickly. And indeed, the salvage officer himself was skiing in Austria at the time of the casualty, hired a private jet, and uh, he probably wasn't skiing in Austria, actually. He was probably just in the mountains in Austria, given it was, um, it was August. Uh, but he hired a private jet and was on board to refloat her in the evening. Uh, I don't think this was the jet he, uh, he, he, he got, but the blue skies were the, were the same. Um, the, the salvors reform, formulated a refloating plan. So it's not a question of just hooking up tow lines and pushing and pulling. You, the, the, it was a highly skilled refloating operation. You, you saw in the AIS video, uh, what I called the wiggling as the salvors broke the suction. It, it should be noted that the uh, owners had engaged 
salvage consultants who had advised that the vessel could not be refloated on the first tide. So the expectations were by naval architects who'd been engaged by the owners is it was not possible to refloat her. And it was the, the, the local knowledge and the skill of the uh, salvors that, that in fact uh, beat the odds. Um, they gave advice on ballasting to reduce stresses as the vessel remained aground and went through a low tide. And of course, to prepare her for refloating to put her in the best condition possible to maximize the prospects of refloating. And of course, during the refloating itself, there was the careful coordination of tugs. Uh, this is a slimline version of the services rendered, but I think it pulls out the key features. The dangers. The dangers faced by the casualty, uh, immobilized until professionally assisted. What, well, what does that mean? Im immobilized means the ship wasn't going anywhere. As we all know, in shipping, time is money. The longer you sit somewhere, uh, the more money somebody somewhere is losing. Uh, and when you have a container ship, uh, which is carrying the equivalent of 10,000 TEUs, uh, the delay is causing uh, significant losses. I think in the 12 hours she was uh, aground, uh, there were some 10 vessels uh, unable to access the port of Antwerp, which is, of course, the second busiest port in Europe. And, and Europe's one of the most important uh, areas for the world economy. Um, uh, so so uh, immobilized until professionally assisted was a very real danger in this case. Uh, the uh, LOF arbitrator found that there was an immediate risk of progressive damage, making the casualty more difficult to solve and ultimately requiring a lightning operation. Now, I mentioned the APL Panama earlier. She grounded in Mexico and uh, the salvors built a jetty out to the vessel and mobilized a crane to put on the end of the jetty on the beach so that they could take the containers off. But you might remember me telling you how big the APL Mexico was compared to the CSCL Jupiter. She was uh, around 4,000 TEUs. Uh, we had a vessel that had a capacity of 10,000 TEUs. Uh, lightening the containers on uh, a fast moving bank on the River Scheldt would have been a wholly different proposition and I think we estimated it would take months not weeks to lighten her to refloat her if if they hadn't been able to refloat her when they did. Uh, there was a short to medium term risk of water ingress into the holds with damage to the cargo. Uh, of course once you get water into the holds uh, then uh, you, you, you're going to cause quite serious cargo damage but apart from that you're going to in it, uh, increase the ground forces, the ground reaction, you make the, the casualty that much more difficult to solve, and you have an added problem of having to dispose of waterlogged containers, which is extraordinarily expensive and problematic. And uh, the other danger that the vessel uh, faced was a liability for blocking the channel and dredging costs. Uh, we had a, uh, there was, there was evidence uh, in the form of uh, an article from the Dutch equivalent of the Financial Times explaining how if, the, if Antwerp was blocked for very much longer, then the uh, logistics chain in Western Europe would grind to a hold with massive economic losses. And of course, we're now all familiar with the danger of blocking a channel. The Ever Given uh, blocked the Suez Canal for the best part of a week and caused enormous losses. The status of the salvors. Uh, those salvors who are professional and investing in salvage are, of course, more deserving of an encouraging award than those uh, tug owners who occasionally dabble in salvage when the opportunity arises. These salvors, Multraship and Kotug Smith, who've since been, of course, subsumed into Baluda, are both highly professional salvors of the highest order, uh, investing in salvage equipment, as was demonstrated by their ability to mobilize so many salvage assets promptly 
uh, in time to refloat her 12 hours after she had gone aground. Now, it only took 12 hours in this case, and, and many, a, a property underwriter will say, well, this, the, the, the award should not be out of proportion to the services rendered. Dr. Lushen, Lushington, who is uh, the historical architect and guiding force behind the modern law of salvage, said in the General Palmer, that the short period of time occupied by the service was unsuccessfully urged in support of a small tender. He observed, I am at a loss to conceive why a patient should complain of the shortness of an operation. It's not mere, the mere time occupied, it is not the mere labour, but the real value of the services rendered. And I always quite like that quote because it just makes us think if you were going into surgery, you're not going to complain to the doctor that he didn't take very long um, uh, and, and his fee should be reduced accordingly. You're paying for his skill and for the benefit that he is conferring from the service he is providing to you. So there we have her. Uh, the, the only thing that the only ingredient missing from this uh, 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 case is bad weather. Although, as Graham told me, bad weather can be a salvor's friend. So no friends around in this case. Uh, a perfect August uh, day. Uh, I, I'm going to ask you all in the chat to um, choose which of these short summaries you think is the most appropriate to encapsulate the uh, services that were rendered in this case. If you could just put on the chat A, B or C. I can't see the chat, so tell me when they start slowing down, Nikki, and I'll um, move on. So we've got um, quite a few people that have said uh, C. Good. Well, I'm sure the Salvors would be highly delighted. I think that horse is also how the uh, arbitrator saw it. Um, OK, so you've applied your mind to that. I'd, I'd, I, I'm not going to give you the precise figure that was awarded. Um, uh, uh, salvage arbitrations are kind of quasi confidential. They're confidential, but they're published on Lloyd's and any law firm that's a subscriber, indeed any company that's a subscriber can read the award and see it for themselves. But it probably wouldn't be appropriate for me for, to simply publicize it. Nevertheless, uh, I think I could, we, could, we can have a stab and see, see where, you, where you get to. Remember, you have got $350 million worth of property that was salved. You have 12 hours uh, services, uh, but you have uh, those services being rendered by some 16 tugs and 17 highly skilled salvage uh, uh, personnel having flown in from Austria. And you, uh, you have some very, very serious dangers. Uh, so having regard to all of that, please enter A, B, C, D or E as being uh, the closest figure to the award that you think would be appropriate in this case. So we've got um, quite a few coming in, a mixture of D and E's, but I think E might just be, oh no, maybe, I think that, yeah, D and E, um, even I think roughly at the moment. Okay, well, I, th I think th those of you who did C are on the money, but what I always find interesting about this exercise is that when people are not giving away their own money, they're always way more generous than if it is in fact coming out of the pocket that they have. But I, 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 there is a, as many of you will be aware, there is a raging debate at the moment about uh, whether LOF is still a viable contract. Uh, anyone who's involved in the profession regards it as the only contract that's appropriate having regard to all the circumstances. Anybody who is arguing against LOF needs, I think, first of all, to read Lord Donaldson's report on cleaner seas, safer seas, or safer seas, cleaner seas, uh, which explains the rationale behind uh, salvage. Uh, that report came out following uh, two very large uh, tanker losses, which caused widespread pollution, and uh, public reaction to uh, to those kind of maritime disasters. And I've heard it said that very large container ships are like the uh, tanker spills of our day. 
Uh, we read probably it, during every winter, where there's probably three or four large container ships which are having stows collapse and containers fall over the side and pollute our seas. Uh, and it, the, the, those container ships, the maritime industry at large needs salvors to have equipment on standby to avert maritime disasters. And uh, the, the awards should be encouraging. Uh, and I would encourage all of the, those of you who are at the younger end of the pro profession to not take as gospel what more senior managers might be saying. Those people who have to write the checks are always going to be a little bit tighter. Of course, their jobs is to pay, to, to pay as little as possible. But ultimately, this is the best way of protecting our environment, uh, having a strong and uh, secure salvage industry. Uh, and so I, I think we should always keep that in mind. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daryl. Um, so I think we can move on just to the kind of the last section, um, which is our Q&A section. Um, I've seen that we've got one question in the chat um, and that um, Johan's already um, answered another one. Um, if anyone has any other additional questions, please uh, say now. Um, but so one that we have um, in, is from um, Tatiana Jacob, um, and I think it's for you, Johan, which says, from your experience, what jurisdictions are particularly favoured by parties? I think just unmute yourself, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Nikki. I, I actually went back to Tatiana um, to write oh, my own chat. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think she's, hopefully that answer was okay. Oh, she's got another question now for Daryl, I think. So, um, Daryl, I know you can't see the chat so I, I can read it out for um, yep. everyone's benefit um so um she says what do parties generally regard as disadvantages of um lof uh, it, it's perceived to be too expensive i mean it basically it's down to how much the awards are uh for the services rendered i think there was a particular controversy after um the awards were uh, high by a former appeal arbitrator in what we call rescue tow cases. So rescue tow cases are where the salvors, uh, a yellow page salvors, they, uh, a, a vessel was, it, um, was immobilized until professionally assisted. It didn't, it wasn't exposed to any other dangers. Uh, a tug would be subcontracted in uh, and then an LOF award would be sought and the LOF awards were coming out at Th three times the cost to the salvor of subcontracting in a tow um, uh, in the tug uh, and this caused uh, uh, a, a bit of a uh, stink. Um, I think we're broadly past that. Rescue tows will always be a little bit controversial uh, and, and arguably if you're only immobilized until professionally assisted and you're not in any other danger then commercial tows will 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 always be a, an option, but in true salvage cases where there are other dangers and where prompt assistance is required and there is no time to negotiate contracts, then I don't think there are any disadvantage. But there is the oft made complaint that the award is too high. But whether the award is too high or not is a matter of impression and often influenced by whether the money is coming out of your own pocket. Right. Oh, we've got um, another question. Um, um, Tashian says, thank you, Daryl, as well. Um, so it's um, from back and Milford, uh, Max Milford, and it says, do you think the salvage slash response industry is well prepared to tackle future fuels ships from both practical and legal perspectives? Well, I, I don't know that I can fully answer that. What I think I can say is I think the salvage industry uh, uh, is um, very capable of evolving quickly. Uh, and uh, whenever there is a new danger, they will acquire the expertise to meet that danger. Uh, so, you know, when salvage started, there were sailing ships. Then we moved from sailing ships to steam driven coal powered ships to ships uh, powered by oil. And now we're 
potentially moving forward to uh, to renew to 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 uh, greener forms of fuel. I've got no doubt the salvage industry is well able to uh, adapt. Whether they've adapted already, I, I'm not so sure because I'm not so sure that yet that many vessels have moved across to cleaner uh, forms of fuel. Thank you. I can see there's another question from Lorenzo. Um, Lorenzo asks, um, what about the efforts and cooperation by the crew in danger to the salvos? Are, are these taken into account to limit the re reward? Uh, the answer is no. In fact, under the salvage convention, the crew are under a duty to cooperate and render reasonable assistance to the salvors, but it's certainly not a limiting factor. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think we'll cut off the Q&A time as I know it's um, approaching um, 10 o'clock UK time and six o'clock uh, Singapore time. So um, I will just say thank you so much to um, all our speakers, um, really informative talks and um, it's been um, great, great to have you here. Um, for everyone who has been in attendance, thank you for attending. I hope you've been able to um, speak using the uh, chat function and things like that. And um, yeah, I hope that we can um, see you at some future um, events. Um, but thank you very, very much to everyone involved.